Okay, so my intention is to, to give a bit of a seminar. Now, this is part of uh, a research seminar series which we're tying to the Catalyst and SUPI project. So that's the Schools University Partnership Initiative and the Catalyst for Public Engagement with Research or, or Engaged Research. Um, so for the next 40 minutes, I'm basically going to talk about my research and how that relates to some of the public engagement work and hopefully try to tease out some of the reasons why I work in that particular way. And then if there's, uh, if there's any energy for it, a bit of discussion around how some of these things might relate to other activities that we're involved in. Because I'm kind of assuming that most of the audience are either associated with the Catalyst or the Schools University Partnership Initiative or other aspects of public engagement work maybe with across the university. Yeah? So it's that kind of, that's the audience that I've got in mind. All right. So I should say a little bit about myself. My name is Trevor Collins. I'm a research fellow here at the OU. I came to the OU to uh, join the psychology department back in 1994. I did visualization. So I'm interested in how visual representations can be used to help people understand things. All right. Now, way back then, I was interested in computer algorithms and how, how you could use visualization to help people understand how software was working. Right. The work that I've done since hasn't all been software, but it's always around representations. It's always around how people understand things. It's always around trying to get an idea of the kind of activities that people are doing when they're learning things, when they're trying to improve how they understand things or do activities. So the little bit of work that I'm going to talk about now, when we uh, came up with this idea for the seminar, was really just trying to link it to this participatory uh, approaches to design, which is something that I'm really interested in, involving people uh, to create things that that help their understanding or help their learning. Sort of, I see people as a fairly critical part of that. So what I'm going to cover is mainly a bit around some of the big theories that I think are really important for that and that have got something to say beyond just my work, but maybe other, other stuff to do with engagement. All right. So the big one is social constructivism. That's, that's been around a while. Uh, and that's probably the majority of what we'll talk about. So I'll very briefly begin by saying basically what it is, uh, social constructivism, been around a long time. Um, some of those implications and how that have played out in teaching and learning in general, and particularly for the OU. Some of those implications for human-computer interaction. So when you're designing computer systems and interaction design, how those kind of theories play out, what the effect that has on, on design. And then finally, kind of getting quite narrow in terms of my interest, current interests, around technology-enhanced learning and what the implications are for creating tools to help people that actually enhances the learning that they do. Right. So those are, those are the kind of strands of coming together. And that will hopefully be enough theory. That's going to be quite dry. So you know, if anyone wants to interject, have a little joke part way through, that might be quite nice, because it's a bit harsh. Uh, and then I'll specifically talk about practice. All right. So these are the things, the theories that I think have informed what I've done. And this is the bit that I've been doing recently. So I've been working with a, a group called the Field Studies Council and putting some of that work into practice to, to try to create a system with them. So I'll talk about that. And then finally, the last couple of little things to, to discuss is then trying to broaden it out again. So try to think about what those implications are for research, what the implications are for engagement, and the kind of activities that hopefully most people in this room are pretty interested in. Does that sound OK? Cool. Brilliant. OK, so uh, social constructivism has touched a lot of what the OU does. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to know all the theory, and you know my background is an engineer. I, I, I did technical stuff, and I like to learn about all these other things. But you know I'm not going to pretend that that's my that's my core strength, right? But in a general sense, hopefully not too um, not too controversial, is this idea that that knowledge we learn stuff through group interactions. We kind of get together, we form these little cultures, little groups that have some kind of shared set of tools, shared things that we that we understand, right? And these understandings come through use. And that's kind of the foundation to this. It's a very kind of succinct way of saying it. But the, the meaning of these artifacts, these things that we use, the meanings that they have comes out from our interactions. The implications of that are huge. All right. So, <laughs> uh, I should say here, Vygotsky, it's kind of you know, cited with all this stuff. He died in 1935. Right? So it was 1978. That's the English translations. It, but that work was way back. You know been around a long time, had a huge influence in terms of lots of stuff that have came since. Right? That's kind of what I would, uh, that's the basis for a lot of this stuff. OK, so how did that play out in terms of teaching and learning? So there's loads of stuff, and, and hopefully it's impacted on everything that you guys have been doing for the last quite a while. Uh, certainly, it's a change within my schooling education that I've seen. From when I was at school, it was very much an instructional model where the knowledge was poured into our heads. 
literally, uh, at times. And uh, that's been less of an approach to instruction, the idea that there would be knowledge that's independent of, of activity, that can, be, that can be attained in some form, to much more an activity-based approach where, where the, the teachers, this approach from Alison King that was, that was published in the early 90s, this idea of the sage on the stage rather than the guide, uh, rather than the sage on the stage moving to the guide on the side. This, someone that supports the activities that you might do. So that learning becomes a very much an activity-based thing. Right? You're not instructed, you're participating. Okay. If you get that, if you're with me so far, the rest is a breeze. If, you, if this is completely challenging your whole world, we're knackered. But I'm hopefully that this is kind of, this is okay. Yeah? Um, but very much around this promoting this active process of thinking. Yeah? So things like analyzing, synthesizing, evaluating, Bloom's taxonomy of educational processes and higher level skills, these things were around from the 70s and stuff, which really kind of fundamental in terms of how we learn. Yeah? These are the kind of things we want folks to do. And then simple techniques, getting groups to work together, how they interact, giving them regular and frequent feedback in a way that you know, addresses misconceptions, distills learning, reinforces understanding, all these kind of reinforcement techniques. And, and things like connections to the real world. You know, that's completely changed uh, in, in terms of you know, the last 40 years. You're learning for something that's useful in the real world. And I think that's, that's touched most subjects. And then simple scripts, things like Think, Pair, and Share. Has anybody came across Think, Pair, and Share? It's one of my favorites. Yeah, <laughs> it's lovely. You've got an audience like this, you tell them to think about something for a minute, and you literally stand here in silence, let them all think. Then let them turn to the person next to them. They pair, and they share, right? and discuss that issue. It's a really nice, active way. Only takes two minutes, but it changes the nature of this kind of conversation. I was in real two minds whether or not to do that, and I thought it might freak out Chris, who's doing the recording. But, 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 um, but these kinds of activities, you know, rather than it being drill, routine, you know, rote learning, think about stuff. How does it relate to what you understand? How, do, can you, how can conversation change the nature of that? And also the jigsaw script, this idea of giving different people different knowledge in order to the, you know, come together to debate a topic, to discuss an issue, challenges like this. These are activities rather than knowledge that's somehow transported into your mind, yeah? So you're, you're, you're getting that knowledge through doing stuff. Any questions so far? You guys are so quiet. So, okay, <clears throat> all right. So the implications for the OU, uh, back in the 70s, uh, uh, you know, there's a guy, Gordon Pask, who came through to the OU at one point. Uh, he was originally from America, but um, did a lot of stuff around conversation theory. This idea that learning as a process is a bit like having a conversation. So if uh, there's a student and a, a learner, if we want to think about it in that way, there's kind of different kinds of questions that we, they may respond to one another. You know, the what questions and the how questions. Right? And this kind of questioning and response process is like a dialogue. Yeah? So the teacher, let's imagine I'm a teacher. It's a bit of a stretch, but if I'm trying to portray something to you, I'll explain it in such a way. You will ask a question, I would hope to God, you know, that, 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 un, that illustrates your understanding and perhaps indicate some of the misunderstandings, yeah? So you, you formulate a question that comes back to me. I formulate an answer that comes back to you. I might even add a cheeky question in the point to, to push your understanding, yeah? So there's this dialogue of process. And it can go through not just conversations, but any artifacts that you produce, yeah? Essays, models, descriptions, whatever, yeah? So at the OU, we've distilled that into the print, uh, dialogue and print model, yeah? As people came across that. It was like Derek Roundtree and stuff. When they were putting those books together through the 80s and 90s that distilled the kind of OU approach, it, they really used these terms. It was just beautiful. For, for me, I really love it. Because it's that idea that you're having a dialogue with your print material. So when you get to partway through a, uh, an exercise, you know, partway through a, a course unit, is it a unit these days? Um, and you, you know, read a section, and there's a set of questions in it that make you reflect on your self-assessment, you sort of get a sense of your own understanding, that's, that's an example of dialogue in print. You do another section, it gives you an activity that you go off and try to do something, come back. Again, it's forcing that, putting what you've read into use. Yeah, active reading, active learning. So that's what the dialogue was all about. And, and Diana Laurelard, who was here as a PVC, you know, uh, back in that time, put it again as a conversational framework. Yeah? So it explained how the OU teaching process built on this theory using these techniques to, to do a framework of conversation. Right? And we're doing it in our online materials, in our books, in our online discussions. It's all around this active process. Okay, that's kind of what I've got to say on that stuff. <laughs> all right. 
The next little bit then is really thinking a bit more about those are the kind of implications, getting a little bit more specific then onto my interests. So the stuff I do is to do with, with computers. Uh, I was a computer engineer. I wasn't a very good computer engineer. I was very interested in people. Okay? So my interest shifted more towards people and what they understood and what they didn't understand when they used computers. And that's going to be pretty clear for the rest of the talk, really. <laughs> so there was, back in the, in, the, in the 50s, 60s, you know, very early days of computers, everything was constrained around the device. Right? It was kind of computer-centered. What was capable, what could be done with logic, what could be done with the machines that we created at that time. They were a bugger to use. You know, it was kind of the computer was king. And we had experts that were trained and developed just to use like, operate a computer. You know, they, were, they were the early computer people. Um, and then there's a big move towards kind of getting a much more human-centered approach yeah? through, the, through the work at Xerox and the early, early work around using the mice and things like that more visual representations of laying out the screen, ideas of the desktop, all of that stuff was much more of a push towards emphasizing the role of the user, the user-centered design or human-centered design. Okay? And a bit, of the, the bit of the buzzword around that from lots of the folks that were involved was this idea of the, you know, knowing your users, knowing what their capacities are, how they perceive things on the screen, what way you should lay out the screen so that they get the easiest way of using that. You're trying to optimize the interaction. You're trying to make it as efficient as possible. Yeah? And that was really needed, because before that, they were an absolute dog to use, you know? really challenging. But by, by addressing a lot of these issues, it moved things along. It didn't stop there. Okay? So uh, since the early 90s, I'd say, there's been much of a push, not just centering the user and the human and focusing on their attributes and efficiency of how they interact with the computer, but thinking a bit beyond the individual human, okay? thinking of people as a group, as much more around the activities they do and the other issues that influence and affect the activities they're able to do. All right? And that's much more pushing it as activity-centered design. All right? So we're much more focused around the context of use. Quite a lot of what I'm going to say is about context. All right? That's really important. And uh, the activities that people are able to do. So this just move from the, the idea that you, know, you could make the tool be efficient to match the the abilities or the strengths of the, of the person, of the operator, the human user. Right? Much more of a push to say, bugger that, that kind of, it's a good idea, but people adapt to tools. You know, the tools, to some extent, mediate and shape the activity we're able to do. Anybody that plays a violin, absolute bugger to use. You know, it's, not, it's not the most efficient, well-matched uh, instrument, yet people are able to do amazing things, play it in a fantastic way. They master, they adapt to the tool, and they operate the tool in a way that's highly proficient. So, uh, so the key issue there, again, was trying to put an emphasis, not necessarily on the computer or on the user, but actually on what it is people are doing with it, right? orientating it towards the activity. Right? And that's the crux. That's the kind of point. And I think that comes out of social constructivism, this idea that people understand stuff through how they work together using artifacts that are shared in a way that's meaningful, in a way that it gives them shared meaning. And that's why it plays out that way in design. So in practice, this again is informed by a bunch of theories. Activity theory is probably your kind of front and center. Most folks think this is the, the bee's knees for this stuff, and it probably is. Uh, but the one I love, my personal preference, is uh, distributed intelligence, the work of Roy P. and a few other folks who I think are absolutely on it. And, uh, and then the social sociology people, who again are coming in there with the old social construction of technology and ideas around the social construction of science, which is a very much allied field. Right? So, I'll say a little bit about them, and then we're going to be pretty much done with the theory, yeah? Folks okay? Huh? No questions so far. What's happening? Yes, it's all right. It's nice. <laughs> okay, so activity theory, again, I said this is a big thing. It's been around a long time. Uh, the folks that get credited with this are the Russian group and the Scandinavian group. Russians, they were kind of, you know, uh, been around a long time. Probably the biggest one would be Letonev. Uh, um, in the 70s and things like that. Um, but the one that I love is this Suzanne Bodker. Okay? So she's really applied it directly to technology, right? really interested in how computers as tools mediate activities. And this is her big thing, and I think she's made a huge contribution in trying to think about activities in these ways. She took activity theory, applied it really directly in the context of using computers and how you could apply activity theory to interpret that process. So it's all the things that you'd like to kind of you like to kind of think, and hopefully, I like this stuff, so I shouldn't get overexcited. But the, the idea that the activity, the device you're using, 
uh, the, the, you know, the device you're using kind of mediates different activities. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, so that's all kind of really important in terms of um, in terms of the computer tool. Yeah. What it is, the tool helps you uh, and kind of determines to some extent the activities you can do. Um, the artifacts, the things you're using, are historical, right? So they've got, they're not just shaped by what you're doing with them, but they're reshaped over time. And people's use of them is reshaped over time. Implications of these things are really huge, right? In terms of like using devices and how they're changing over time, this whole activity use stuff is really significant. And then although we're working together in groups, yeah, so there is a kind of collective action in terms of how we're operating these things, activity itself is conducted through actions and operations of individuals. So again, this does my head in, but it's um, the little individual activities that folks do have a, have a big impact, yeah? So it works like a network. Right? The, the operations that I, that I do as an individual can affect uh, the activity that's spread across all of us. And in terms of designing systems, that's quite a fundamental shift, right? It's a really important shift. Wow, the floor is bouncing up and down. The, the thing moves a little bit. So, uh, so the last... Then the last point of uh, the Bodker stuff is around these um, activities being interwoven. Yeah? So when you're, when you're trying to understand a system, you're not going to an individual activity, you're going to a context of use, this whole context-based activity design stuff. right? And I'm not doing one activity on its own, it's part of a big network, a big bunch of other stuff. I've got shed loads to do this week, and on Monday I'm going to do this stuff, and it's going to affect this other bunch of stuff. Right? So trying to design for tools, it's not about the tool and the efficiency, it's about the whole thing, the whole context, all the other activities you're going to impact on as a result. It changes the nature of design quite fundamentally. So she uses these metaphors and ways of analysis. So the metaphors that she uses is system, which is like your bird's eye view, where you try to map out the whole picture. Bit of a job to do that, to be honest. And uh, then the media, how things are being spread within these cultures, what, what are the mechanisms that are enabling things to be shared, and then the tools. What are the bunches of things that people use? So are they using pen and paper? Is there forms? Are there primary uh, activity around a set of documents? Red form, yellow form, whatever it is we use at ELU for, for getting grants these days. Yeah, these kinds of things, tools. And the bit that I love the best is the why, the, the what, and the how. So no matter what I do, it always comes down to that. It's trying to work out, in any given context, why it is somebody's doing something. Yeah? What it is that they're actually doing, what are the, what's the process involved, and how are they achieving it, and why is that important? All of these kind of things. So just taking a set of activities, trying to understand it at these levels, and then that gives you, gives you a framework for design. Yeah? So if I'm going to make a tool that helps you do something, I've got to understand what you're doing first. I've got to understand why you're doing it. I've got to understand the context that you're doing it in. Otherwise, there ain't going to be any match between design and practice. Yeah? Whew. Cool, that was my hardest one. I don't like that, describing that stuff. OK, the next one's distributed intelligence. This is my favorite one. I like this. <laughs> so this is lovely, because this was um, Roy P, who is based at uh, SRI, Stanford Research Institute, I think. And uh, he's lovely, because he swallowed this activity stuff big time in the 70s. He completely, completely took it on board, influenced the rest of his work for about 20, 30 years. You know, he's, and he's had such an impact in terms of technology enhanced learning. He's a real major player uh, in, in my perspective. So he, he, he applied this in the context of, of computers as tools. Right? And he reckoned that intelligence was, wasn't the attribute of an individual, but it's an attribute of a society, of a group. Right? And the whole idea was that it's distributed between people and between the tools that they use. So we're able to be clever people partly because of the tools that we're using. There's intelligence somehow in the tools or part of the tools. It's mediated through the tools, these intelligent activities. Again, so once you take on, <laughs> once you take on the whole social constructivism thing, right? Round activity and all that. All of this stuff slots into place, I think. So he's fascinated by action and what it is that, that people are doing, which is, is kind of important. Uh, and he likes to phrase it as being distributed across people, environments, and situations, right? Now, the implications of this for design, again, are kind of significant, right? If I sit in my office and design a system, the chances of it fitting into the environment that it's maybe used in, or the situation in which people place themselves in, is, is, could be hit and miss, yeah? I've got to go out there. I've got I to be part of it, yeah? So it's understanding not just, you know, 
understanding activities in these ways. And he likes to think of it as this, this tools that you use enable you to reorganize what you're doing. They have this relationship, this idea of the activity being mediated through the tools. So just plan it out in practice. So then, yeah, the way I'd phrase that then is from this bit of a move away from the computer as a method of delivery. So, you know, in the early days of computer-aided instruction, it was literally, you know, here's your course and PDF file equivalent. You know, here, it's a delivery mechanism. It's the instruction. It's the pouring it into your head via the USB pen or, or whatever it would have been, you know. Um, as opposed to using a computer as an as a artifact, as a potential way of creating activity, activities that you can design and set up in a way that enable people to learn stuff. All right? So all of this, think, pair, share, jigsaw, all of that, yeah? It's just all of the same. Very dry so far. Anybody all right? Okay, last one. Social construction of technology. So again, this is, I think, a nice play out of these kinds of theories and these kind of consequences. So when you apply the social constructionism stuff into, into how technology gets developed, right? so this isn't individual design. This is the big program stuff. Uh, and these guys, uh, Pinch and Biker, they, they did a stack of stuff in the 80s. And uh, the lovely thing that, that one of the lovely papers that they did uh, was looking at the, the evolution, if you like, the development of uh, bicycles. Right? So the early bicycles and what it was that was chosen. What were the features that were chosen and why? And they came through this social construction of technology as a framework, right? as a process for interpreting action, for try to understand these choices that people have. And I think it's really, really powerful when you try to think about technology and how it's actually used in practice. So they broke it down in terms of the, what are the social groups that are important, right? So in, in early bicycles, it was sports cyclists, leisure cyclists, gentlemen, ladies, all these different kind of groups that were identified as social groups that were engaging in, in, the, in the, you know, buying bicycles. And then what are their perceived problems, right? So you do it through the social group. What are the problems that these groups are having? So it's not technology determined. It's totally by people. Uh, and then the relationship between those problems and possible solutions. Right. So a really nice example with these guys is the early bicycle. I'll do two examples, because the picture illustrates this lady sitting side saddle. Right, on a bike. They created a bicycle that the lady didn't have to sit with her legs across the, the wheel. Right. Rubbish as a bicycle, okay? Functionally a nightmare. It was unbalanced, it was flaking, you know, never gonna be successful, never gonna work, yet totally socially determined. Ladies couldn't necessarily, you know, in the, in the social norms at the time, uh, ride a bicycle in another way. Uh, second example is the air, uh, this idea of having air in your tires, right? Early days, that was crazy. It was like riding on a cushion of air, bobbins, that would never, you know, that's never going to work. That's, that air as a, as a thing isn't, isn't strong, like rubber and leather and metal and these other things that we would have made wheels out of at the time, yeah? So there's a whole perception around using air as a, as a way to, to get the vibration out of the bicycle. So the problem there, the perceived problem was the vibration. Uh, the solutions that people had were cantilevered frames. They had uh, springs in the seat that like made you bounce up and down. The bicycle itself still shook like hell, but you were okay because you were bouncing up and down. Um, and then the old air thing. And the air, it took ages for air to work. It was only because the sports cyclists could actually go faster. And if they hadn't proven that the sports cyclists could go faster, it may never have taken up. You know? so, it's very much around this process where the choice of technology is, is socially determined, is, is according to these groups that are adopting it and why they're adopting it and what it is that's important to them. So this is a really trivial example, but you can apply this to mobile phones, iPads, you know, computers. They're all there. It's all kind of determined in that way, <coughs> I think. <laughs> okay, so we're doing pretty good. It's only 25 minutes. You folks have been so silent. It's all right, yeah? All right, okay. So that's all of the theory stuff. I'm kind of talking now about implications for technology-enhanced learning. So I've talked about me design stuff uh, and where, where some of that stuff comes from and why it's determined in that way. Uh, why it's so important to look at context. Yeah, why that's really significant. Because actually, that's where, that's, where the, that's where the meaning's coming from. So the implication for tell. This, these, again, are a bit tough. So... Uh, if you're gonna buy into this kind of activity-based stuff, then the, the kind of some of the key work is around action research, yeah? Sort of participatory action research uh, that, that Kurt Lewin and lots of other folks have had an influence in about planning an action, doing something, observing how it plays out, 
and then reflecting on, on that, right? And the idea behind the action research cycles is that you iterate through that over time, yeah? So that it's really quite nice. You can, you can put this alongside the social construction of technology and just see how it's playing in time, because it just does. Because, you know, they planned the design, they made it, they put it into use, people hated it, they tried again. Do you know what I mean? You can play it out in use. Uh, but it's not necessarily just a descriptive thing. It can be put into action in a, in a predictive way. Yeah? So we can plan. For technology-enhanced learning particularly, we plan a design. Right? It's not just random. We don't just go into a classroom and find out what works. Um, there's a bit of purpose to it. Okay, and that's played out in design-based research. So Anne Brown and a bunch of her other colleagues way back in the early 90s, they were doing this idea of design-based research where they, they Anne Brown, she was, she was uh, trained up as a proper, uh, proper is the wrong word, sorry. Uh, she was trained up as a, as a, as a you know, hard-nosed laboratory tester, right? Bring folks in, test them in a laboratory in controlled conditions, very scientific, very controlled. There were some issues that she discovered with that, didn't necessarily fit everything she wanted to do, so she moved to try these other approaches where it was completely class-based. She'd go into schools, take classes, work with teachers, do their activities in order to understand the culture and the context of a classroom. Then she could plan what she's going to do, change the activities that the, that the kids were doing, work with them in a way that would change the nature of their learning. Okay? So her research was then completely context-based, totally away from, not totally, she kept, actually throughout her career, she married up the two. Absolute beautiful example of marrying between the two. Yeah? You could test stuff in the laboratory, that's useful for some things. You could be context-based in the classroom, that's really powerful for a lot of other things. And she married the two really, really well. But critically, design-based research was all around uh, action, I think, and context. So some other work uh, to mention in the context of this is the uh, stuff around sustain, sustaining technology innovation. So a bunch of folks that have been doing technology enhanced learning for an awful long time, and these guys were based at Michigan. Uh, they had done some fantastic work around project-based work. For, for schools, getting kids to think about projects as a focused form of activity, and how teachers can support that in a motivational way, how technology can be used in a motivational way. And they put in this huge program, like covered the whole state, you know, um, about changing the nature of, of schools, of, of teaching in schools, to be around this project-based activity stuff. Um, so they wrote the lessons that they learned up from that in terms of the systemic change. Right? So the issue with technology, you take it, you do it, you know, you do a project, all works great. You take it into school, hopefully the school will work with you, it might work great. You leave it with the school and it goes pear-shaped. And it's all around what are the issues about sustaining it and making it the systematic change. So their issues were around sustainability in terms of how it could be sustained, scalability, how it could be ruled out to other contexts, and usability. And the nice distinction for their usability was that it took it away from the human-centered usability about performance and efficiency. And they considered usability in terms of the divergence uh, between people's capacity to do stuff and the, the capacity required to adopt the technology. Right? So the classic one in schools is um, it's a Windows-based school and you've got Macintosh-based equipment. Ain't ever going to happen, right? <laughs> Ain't ever going to match up. Uh, so it's around trying to see where those, the capability of the institution that you're wanting to affect and the capability required for your technology. By bringing the two together, you've got a lot better chance of it being used. Culture, some things you do are just going to be challenging within the cultural norms of that institution. Institutions that don't use technology at all, you take in technology, you've got quite a, a change in culture to address there before you start. Yeah? Um, policy and management is how it fits into things like you know, uh, training, development, recognition, all these other issues. Yeah? It's a nice one because they, they pull this from such a wide range of studies. But again, it's coming down to how practice is mediated through use. So, in summary, all of that stuff is, it changes the nature of technology and design is going from product development, right? So here's the technology I've produced, to sustainable change. Here's a different way of teaching. Here's a different way of learning. And that transition is quite big. You know, it's not about technology, it's about the people, it's about their training, it's about the capacity, it's about all of these other things. Just broadens the scope quite a lot. Obviously, you do it in teams. Okay, right. Any questions at that point? No. Okay. So the little practical bit now um, is around this kind of stuff I've been doing with the Field Studies Council. So 
we park all that theory stuff, that's kind of what I've been trying to understand, get my head around for quite a number of years. And it kind of informs the technology I do, because I fundamentally believe that it's not about the technology, it's about the people and how they interact with it and what activities it enables them to achieve. So here's how I played it out. Uh, I've got some funding from the Wolfson uh, funded project, the Open Science Lab that was, that was done here at the OU. They let us do a six month project with the, with the Field Studies Council and the idea was to look at mobile learning, uh, mobile technologies that they may use, right? So there was no requirement or onus on them to adopt this technology. My whole purpose for doing it was that I've already worked in this area for quite a while. I get to go out with OU courses and OU students maybe once every year or once every two years, or maybe two or three times in a year if there's quite a few courses running, yeah? Because our, the way our fieldwork courses are done is that they're only done periodically, yeah? They don't always need me. That's the other aspect, it's a bit of a pain. Um, whereas these guys are taking school groups out every single day. Right? So if, just to say the, the context, the Field Studies Council, for those of you who may not have came across them, um, it's their 70th anniversary. They've been going 70 years. They do environmental biology, kind of field work based learning. Uh, they're, they're expanding to other topics as well. But the whole idea about their approach is it's a residential center. Okay. Across the UK, they've got 14 residential centres and three day centres. Right? So places where school groups can go and learn about hands-on science, kind of practical environmental biology, whatever these things are. Right? One in ten of the population have been to, uh, or more than one in ten of the population have been to field study centres during their schooling. Most schools now go. Uh, they're booked up about three years in advance. Each year they have around 140,000 people that go through their courses. 10,000 are, are adults. Right, doing various adult education things. 130,000 of them are kids from primary, secondary, uh, and college level as well. Right, so that's their, that's their game. So they're going out and doing this field work stuff every day. So for me, it's a golden opportunity. I can't help but if I work with these folks, I'm going to learn about stuff because they're doing it in a way that, at a scale that, that we don't currently. I kind of hope as well they might learn a bit from us. So there's this, this whole idea about it being a collaborative thing. Uh, the, the way I managed to sell it to them was this field network system that we could produce together. It would be a portable communications toolkit, which they can take out. So it's basically where they go to do their field work hasn't got internet connectivity, right? They've got uh, tablets. They've got those little um, Android tablets or iPads, things like that. They really like to use them. Without the internet, they're a bit crap, right? Um, so they need to have some way of, of connecting them up to do useful group stuff because a lot of their teaching approach is around group stuff. Uh, so that's what they wanted to use. And the thing we wanted to produce was something very specific to the activities that they're interested in doing. Okay, so really tie it uh, down to their activity. Right, okay, probably got hmm, not much longer. So as I said before, uh, the FSC do outdoor learning. They are experts, they've been doing it quite a long time. Uh, the OU, I think are quite good at this technology enhanced learning stuff. We've been doing it quite a long time. So there was a, quite a good reason for to have a two-way collaboration. Right? I'm not pretending that, that uh, both parts are equal in all contexts, but together we can work in, in quite a shared way. Right? Manage to work together quite well. Uh, very much in terms of the approach is this participatory thing. So I go there, I spend a lot of time with them. I understand the context in which they work, which is a uh, picture on the right-hand side there is a river. Uh, with uh, Jim, one of the, it's quite a dark picture, sorry. Jim, one of the tutors, is standing in the river explaining to me how they teach river studies, and I'm writing notes at the time. It was March, it was bloody freezing. And, you know, um, so, but, it, but it highlights the importance of being quick. When you're in the field, you've got to act quickly. That's kind of a fundamental thing, brings it home. When people say, don't worry about how long it takes to set up the technology, that is not the case. It has to be instant, you've got to be there and out again, bloody quick. So all those kinds of things that come home uh, uh, very much clear to you when, you when you do the context stuff. Uh, we looked at stuff that they do around ponds, which is there's a trophic structure, which is who eats who, right? So if you've got a pond, some bugs eat other bugs, some bugs eat plants, some bugs eat dead bugs, right? So that process. And you have a relative number of each kind of bug, right? Because you need to keep the place clean and tidy. So that's kind of how the system works. They take a day to cover that kind of stuff, you know, so much more efficient when I explain it. Um, and then the wet system, which is how ponds are used to filter uh, poo and stuff out of water, right? So the role that animals have in breaking down waste, 
and, and, and get kids measuring that is quite good fun. You know, so they can go out and do that. And also river discharge, this thing at the top. So you go down a river, work out how much is flowing, how much is lost, all these kinds of things. And the effect that has on the environment. Right? So their onus is all around context. It's all about learning in context. Right, so be quite specific now. In terms of a day at the FSC, if you go on one of their centers, this isn't always the case, but it's a fair approximation. You start in a classroom at, at a field center, and they'll talk about all the stuff that you're going to do for the day. So introduce the topic, plan your hypotheses, what it is you want to try to understand, how you're going to do it, the methodology. And quite importantly, they talk through risk assessment, which I thought was going to be a real pain, but it was really fascinating how they teach it. Because it gets the kids to work out what the risks are and what they're going to do about it. And that changes, again, ownership and all kinds of stuff. They go out in the field, they collect data, so they've got their flip charts over there, and uh, take notes of what they're doing, and then they come back in a classroom, somebody enters the data rather rapidly, if they can, and they try to tidy it up, put all the data sets together, so they might have a class of 30 kids, they'll work in groups of three or four, so you might have you know, quite a bunch of different groups, but you bring all the data together because you can make a better story from it. Yeah, it's more robust when you collect it all together. Uh, and then the analysis and interpretation. So, as an institution, they're oriented around field-based teaching. Contextualized learning, right? It's all about the outdoors. But for this activity, um, this is the bit that they really prize. You know, this is the field base. And this is kind of necessary preamble, and it's a pain in the ass that you have to come back for this stuff, right? So by trying to understand the activities that people do, the context that they do, the kind of values of the organization and what's important to them, it was kind of obvious that you wanted to get this, this bit bigger and these bits less. Right? So obviously that's kind of what technology is good for. So that's what we did. So I'll very quickly say a little bit about this field network system. Um, so this is it. Um, it's very, very simple. It's a rucksack. Uh, a little bit more than that in a rucksack. Um, there's a, it's basically a laptop um, which will run as a, a website. Right? So that runs as a web server. Okay. Um, There's a little wireless router, which is this thing. Okay, so this is, gives you a Wi-Fi network, a bit like you have at home. Yeah, so if you've got internet wireless at home or in the office, there's one hiding here somewhere. Um, it's like that, right? This is a waterproof one, which is kind of handy if you're doing ponds and, and rivers and rain and stuff. So that's the network, and, and then the battery is obviously the last bit. That's the battery to power it. Okay, so that's it. Shouldn't have taken six months to put all that together, but it did. Um, the, 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 there's a few practical things around that. The laptop, we would have liked a smaller and lighter one. Um, about five years ago, we could have bought netbooks, and now you can't buy them, yeah? Because they're, they're not as popular, because those blasted iPads, and laptops became a lot cheaper. So a laptop like this is 350 quid, which is the cheapest way of giving you that kind of technology power. So when we were trying to design the system, we wanted the cheapest thing that would give you a website. Right? I tried a Raspberry Pi. You know those little Raspberry Pis that are 26 quid? They're, sh they're rubbish as web servers. Uh, Raspberry Pi, they're, they're little small computers that, that, that run. They're very, very cheap. Uh, they, they run the Linux operating system. And they will run this website, but it'll take 15 seconds to serve a page. So that's not going to be practical. Uh, I tried the little tablets, uh, you know, those tablet computers. Again, that can run this software. You can set it up in such a way to make it do it. It takes about eight seconds to serve a page. Again, pretty pants. Um, whereas a cheap laptop goes like off a shovel, and it uh, serves web pages really well. Right? So that was that. Uh, that's it, yeah. So the kind of choice of the technology, trying to make stuff web-based, uh, is really critical for this context. Right? <laughs> Because folks, the FSC aren't a software house. They're not going to maintain software that requires maintenance. Yeah? The organization can handle websites. They've got an IT team that do websites. They're really, really good at doing websites. And they're really, really good at doing networks. Because they go into all of their centers, and they set up Wi-Fi networks that kids can come in and blatter to watch YouTube and all the other stuff that kids do at their centers. So this technology, the IT team really understand. And the website technology, the IT team really understand. So we're on to a winner in terms of like matching it to the capacity and skills of the organization. Yeah, all right, that's about it. I was going to show you the website, but I'm not going to blatter through it, because I'll only rush it, and there's no point. 
The, the key thing with this was uh, the, reason, the reason why we, as I said, the, uh, the organization, they've got these little tablets that they can take out um, and they just connect to the Wi-Fi network and then they can connect to the laptop. Right? So when, uh, when they grow out as a group, you see the screen here. So this is, a, this is the, the laptop uh, showing the screen. The same thing then, just, just the flow of the page is done slightly differently for a, for a mobile device. But it's the same, it's just a web page. Um, but the nice thing with that is that they, rather than recording their data on paper, they record it on the, on the, on the device here. And by them recording on the device here, obviously they're not actually recording it on the device here, they're recording it on this device here. Yeah? And the nice thing that that's able to do, because it's a website, is it brings all the data together. Yeah? So that thing of entering your data and collating the data is done automatically. It happens instantly. Yeah? So as they're putting their data in, every time they add another data item, their data records on this row. Yeah? And the, the collected data, data set of, of the whole group, of the class of 30, yeah, is all pulled together and done on a table just below it. Right? So while they're putting in their data, they're able to see what's coming in. Right? Changes the nature of the activity. So that idea about being separated, you're in the classroom, you go out the field, you come back in the classroom, this bit gets stretched. Yeah? This is automated as far as possible. They can still go back and do some of this, and often a lot of school stuff do. They go home and write, up, write it up as a project. You know. But the point is that they're spending more time in the field. They're able to contextualize not just the data collection, they contextualize the interpretation, the analysis. And that's fundamental in terms of learning outdoors, because yeah, they're able to relate it to the environment. OK, so in terms of the organization, that was, a, that was an absolute easy sell. They loved that idea. Uh, and that all worked. So I'll very, very quickly just say about the, the process. These are me stakeholders, or you can call them participants or users or whatever label you like. But these are the folks who made this system, much more so than, than me and Chris, who, who were involved from the, from the OU. Uh, the tutors, people that tutor at the FSC, were, were the paramount, uh, most important players, them and the IT team. So this is Javi, who, who works for the IT. And he's out there doing a, a Wi-Fi network and us around their pawns. All right? So the point of this is that it's not me doing it all. It's these guys. They go out. They play their part. Uh, this is a bunch of uh, OU FSC tutors in the bottom right-hand corner there. They get together. They've been tutoring for about a year, and they get together each year to, as part of their ongoing professional development. Right? The nice thing with this was that I got invited to go and present to them. Right? So they took it out. They worked with it. They, I'm glad to say, loved it, <laughs> and they all kind of wanted it. Yeah? So then it creates a problem for the company, for the organization, to try to get that out there to the different groups. Right? So I'm kind of creating demand a little bit uh, along what we're doing. But, but having these people involved is fundamental. Right? So if I was creating a system, the only people, if I was thinking about the users and the human-centered approach, the only person I'd think about would be the tutors and possibly the students. Yeah? If I want this to be used in this organization, it's these folks who are going to make a difference. Right? So fundamental, at the very beginning of it, the curriculum development manager was the person who coordinated a lot of the activity. Right? She's nothing to do. She very rarely gets involved in day-to-day -day teaching. She coordinates the whole thing, though, across in terms of curriculum development. So having her on board, she got us in touch with everybody, everybody across the organization. And this was fantastic. You know, made a big difference. So the, she put us in touch with the biodiversity training manager right? who was acted on two fronts. They told us all about the national data sets and how they're collecting data that feeds into other activities nationally that gives them huge recognition nationally and internationally. So if I can speak to that agenda, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm on to a winner. Um, but she also put us into, she also coordinates a lot of the training stuff, right? So it was her invitation that gave me a chance to speak to the other tutors from across all of the centres. Um, while I was talking to those guys at the at the other the other uh, centres at their training event. The uh, grant officer, national grant officer for Field Studies Council, came along uh, to listen in because I'd already primed her because I wanted more money to carry on working. So she came along, saw the whole thing, saw the reaction of the tutors, and that made a big difference in terms of everything from that point on because she then put us in touch with the directors. So the director of communications, director of publications, uh, and the director of operations. They were the people at the very senior level that organized the direction of the company, yeah, the, of, the, of the charity, I should say. It's a charitable organization. Um, yeah, so there, again, their input completely changed the game. Yeah? And at each point, it's drawing on these people as experts. 
in order to inform the design, the design of the activity and the design of it being used within that context. Right? I need all of the people, not just the tutors. Oof, nearly done. <clears throat> right. So this is how it plays out. You break that usability cube thing that I mentioned down in terms of capability, which for me were these people. The culture, I spoke to all these agendas. It had to be fun, had to be engaging, had to be outdoors. And in terms of policy and management, by getting those other folks on board, it just changes the game. I get it into training, I get it into coordination in terms of their IT policy and IT structures. Just, it's not about the technology. Ooh, it's about the process. So, okay. In terms of sustainability and scalability, there are a couple of things in the design. I mentioned some of the technology stuff. Making it a web-based system was critical because these folks can do web. Uh, if you use a content management system where they don't have to write software, any code at all, that's even better, yeah? Because then it can be maintained by lots of other people using standard software tools that anybody in theory can be trained on or developed with, yeah? So that's what we've tried to do. Some success. Um, in terms of minimal configuration, these folks going out, they literally have one group in the morning, another group in the afternoon. Or they may have the same group for three days and they're doing bunches of different activities. So they need to make a minimal change to take the same kit out and do something completely different. Right? So the typical thing with a website is each individual user signs in. That's never going to scale for this organization because you don't know everybody's name beforehand. Some people are sick. Somebody else comes instead. All kinds of things change. It just doesn't work in practice. So we, ha we use generic accounts for all of their mobile devices. So they were already signed in, and they remembered their sign in. So each device had a, had a sticky label on the back that said the username and password in case anybody forgot. Yeah, but you give them out, and it's already on the right page because that's set up as their home page. The only thing that changes on, on the web server, the tutor goes in and says, now this set of, set of users are going to do the pond structure survey. That's one button change. Yeah? Or we're going to do the river survey. That's one button change. But the home page on these devices then becomes that activity yeah? and leads them through it. So that's how you scale up. And to make that work across time, this whole idea about the data sets feeding into the National Register, we structured it around their metadata. Right? So which center they're at, what field location they're going to, is it a river, is it a pond, is it whatever it is, in terms of latitude and longitude as well, so they can actually do georeference stuff. Um, and then things like the sites, the habitats, and the microhabitats. That's the, that's the structure for environmental science stuff. Is, around, is it a, what type of habitat is it? Are there microhabitats within that that we're comparing? Those are the things that allowed us to do it. The last couple of things is diffusion of innovation. So I've talked about the theory, I've talked about my work and kind of what I've done with these guys. I think a lot of it is around the people and the amount of talking you do, and that's kind of important, as well as a little bit about technology, but making it technology that they can do rather than technology that I, that I do. Right? Uh, so trying to bring that out again, uh, another theory that's really useful is this diffusion of innovation. So people came across this. There's a guy, Everett Rogers. In the 1950s, he was studying agriculture in rural America and trying to understand why it was that farmers didn't make use of the latest technology. Couldn't get his head around it. The technology was obviously better than what they were doing, digging holes in the ground, um, but they weren't always taking it up. So the rest of his life was dedicated to understanding these processes of adoption. Yeah? And he did it across uh, medicine, computers, he, lots of kind of things. He rewrote this one book five times over a 40-year 40, 40 period. Yeah? So from the 50s right through to, to early 2000, he was rewriting this book, uh, and he's kind of most well known for this idea of these innovators, early adopters, uh, whatever they're called, early majority, late majority, and laggards. That's the kind of bit that people remember. There's so much more behind it that's quite useful. But for my money, this is social constructivism in, in context. Yeah? Like all the other theories that I've already said, if you think about people learning stuff in groups, this is how they do it. <laughs> social construction and technology, so this is the same thing. Yeah, we're all talking about the same thing, this process of how people do stuff and why. Uh, so the nice things he came up with were things like this relative advantage. So I tried to speak to that in terms of you know, paper-based data collection versus computer-based stuff. This might have been an advantage. How compatible it is with the existing values, that idea of com you know, capacity uh, and cultural norms. Um, how complex it is perceived as. So obviously websites actually are quite complex but they're perceived as quite simple. At least when I explain them, I try to make sure that happens. Yeah? So always want stuff to be perceived as accessible and, and undoable. And they can be trialed and observed very easily. Yeah? So this was his issue about uh, when new technologies came along, how much of an investment did you have to make? Could it just be tried out? 
without having to commit too much effort or time. So for me, trying this with, the, with the Field Studies Council, that's fundamental. You know, the tutors can give it a go. Technology's not perfect, but let's give it a go and see how it works, things like that. Yeah, the feedback that they give me changes the technology and that hopefully helps them teach. So that's all of that. Uh, in terms of deciding whether or not to adopt this stuff, it's not just the decision, but it's the impact of it. Yeah? So it's not just what we do, but it's the result of that. So it's thinking about how it's implemented, it's actually put into practice, not just the idea, and how the outcome of that is confirmed, and what people do. And then the last, yeah, the early years of diffusion research didn't necessarily think that the invention or the idea could be reinvented. They, they kind of viewed it as a static thing. Uh, but the last 20 years or so, 20, 30 years, that's totally recognized as being up for grabs. The whole point of adoption is that it changes the nature of the thing. Hopefully not necessarily to an unrecognizable state, but along those lines. Right. Um, so in the stuff I've done, these are the kinds of topics coming from technology and enhanced learning and getting it into schools, into use. These are things that I find really, really useful in terms of framing how I shape and how I explain this stuff. And in terms of my research, this is kind of where it's at. You know? if, I, if, I want kid, if I want schools to be affected by this, if I want learners to, to have an impact from this stuff, it's these things that I need to attend to. That's, that's what does it for me. So. The next bit's kind of obvious, is kind of open it up a little bit. You folks have been so vocal so far, I'm kind of assuming you're saving it up for, for the next five minutes discussion, you know? Um, you know, so I've gone on about this technology and enhanced learning. I think soci social constructivism has an impact on design and how we think about technology and how technology is used. Um, my argument as well is that it has a huge impact in terms of engagement. Uh, and I think there's a real issue around engagement and what we do with it. Um, so National Coordinating Center would, would identify some of the purposes as to inform, to, to maybe consult an external group, to the, the body of research that's been involved, uh, and to look at collaboration, maybe ways in which collaboration can inform and change the nature of research. You know, these different first order, second order, third order forms of thinking as Alan Irwin phrased it for the communication science. So this is what you folks do, right? This is what we, this is some of the stuff that we sign up for. So you kind of put that lens on it, and it kind of, in my head, it helps. Because um, it's, you know, what are the groups? And how is it that working with them is going to change my meaning, change what it means to me, uh, and being open to change in that, in that regard? So yeah, if you want your research to have an impact, maybe some of this stuff is helpful. And some of these are the ways to achieve that. And you can probably tell where I'm going next is, you know, here's, here's the same thing phrased in another way. And this is very explicit in terms of getting ideas out there. You know, it's referred to as a diffusion of innovation and it's applied to not just technology, but ideas. You know, the, the early, early work around it was, um, how do you get people to treat their water supply in a way that's gonna make it clean and, and reduce illness? How is it that you can have an impact on the uh, diffusion of AIDS? So health issues and treating uh, AIDS and stuff like that. Yeah. They also applied it to how the internet is diff diffused across the world, which I think is lovely too. But, but it's very much a people process stuff. Yeah? So what are the, the channels over time that, uh, that are going to have an effect for us? And um, I really like the idea of being a member of a social system. Uh, that kind of does it for me. I quite like, I quite like to sign up to that. Um, but it's maybe not for everybody. But I I kind of think there's a bit of a story there. So that's me. I'm kind of done. Uh, I'm kind of hoping there might be some questions or thoughts or just a pulse. Anything would be great. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. No pressure. But yeah, oh, go on. Go on. Yeah. I've got a question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm very interesting. I'm wondering about the kind of the context, yeah. So as, as a researcher, you start these processes, say with the Field Studies Council, how do you know or how confident can you be that you kind of nail the context here? Yeah? At what point do you think reasonably confidently, okay, I kind of understand the context, therefore I can move forward. So, and, and related to that, what lessons have you learned through doing this 
mm, numerous projects mm. that you can't apply in this latest one. What have you taken from the early ones to kind of understand that kind of process? And yeah. when do you think, okay, I think I can move forward to this? Yeah, okay, I think, oh, sorry, nice question. Uh, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. I think, um, I know that I haven't nailed it, I guess, is the answer to, to the, the context thing. So I don't, there isn't a point at which I understand it fully, but it's a process. Uh, so I, um, I have no sense, actually, that <laughs> I really understand what's going on. Most of the time, I'm pretty sure I've only gotten part of the picture. But the, more, the thing that I have learned from different projects is the more people you talk to, the more sense of triangulation you get. And for me, that seems to be the best reinforcement. Uh, people are very polite to you and very nice. But if you can get it from enough angles, you can start to pick through it a little bit. Um, I think things that haven't worked in the past have been not attending to the people stuff enough. So I would be focused around the, the effectiveness of the technology, how efficient it is, how functional it is, what it can do, um, how usable it is in terms of like matching, uh, being intuitive to use. Uh, and that was all, uh, obviously it was fantastic research, I'm not doing myself down, but, it, but the, the, the thing for me, particularly around this work, has been to emphasize much more around the capabilities and capacities of the people who will actually be using it day to day and trying to understand where they're coming from. And yeah, it's a partial, totally a partial understanding, but it's a, it's a two-way thing. So if, you can, if I can show, if I can expose my misunderstandings, uh, the, the biggest danger for me is that people assume that I'm clever or that I somehow get it, that I somehow know how they teach, and I tend to not. Uh, similarly, I shouldn't assume that they understand the technology. Is that, why would they? There would be any reason to do that. Um, so it's a, it's a two-way thing. So it is a, yeah, I don't know if it gets resolved, but over time, it, it, the ambiguities get reduced, and the uncertainty gets reduced. It's all an information and uncertainty thing. Sorry, Phil, yeah, yeah, please. Since you just mentioned misunderstandings, that's uh, exactly pointing in the direction of my question. If you look at um, scaling out frameworks such as uh, DD from Harvard, okay. um, then he talks a lot about the traps that you find when you try to go beyond the original target group, beyond the original set of stakeholders and make something really, really big. Yeah. And one of the traps, but they, they all point in similar directions, one of the traps is the trap of unlearning. What do you have to unlearn to go beyond the original context in which it was created. Yeah. Um, so what, what would be your answer to the unlearning question if you look at the work you did with the Field Study Council? What has to be unlearned to open it up to a broader range of people beyond this initial this particular group? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good question because I think um, a lot of the stuff is I've worked quite closely with a particular team at one of the centres. And now, between now and Christmas, the intention is to get it taken up in another center. And next year, it'll be another four centers. So it's like kind of getting it out. But the point with this organization is it's a kind of an umbrella group. You know, they've got these separate centers. They ran kind of differently, um, not totally independently, but they, are, they each has a head of center, you know? And, and what they do is determined by their locality. So these folks that I've worked with, they do a lot of stuff on rivers and ponds because they've got a shed load of rivers and ponds where they live. Um, the folks on the coast, it's a different story, you know? So uh, for me, the assumption is that there's a little grain of the technology, a little grain of the idea that's fundamental that I want to maintain. And then everything else is, is, is for up for reinvention. Right? So my whole idea about this isn't to, to take this and apply it into another context, is to see what works for them in their context and let them uh, hopefully adopt it. You know? um, so the unlearning thing is really me not holding on to stuff. Uh, just because I did a lot of work. I rebuilt this website three times, like significantly, start from scratch three times during the process of developing it. Um, and just because it, it was designed in the wrong way each time. You know, I went down and saw them. They said, I explained the system, how it worked. I could see their faces go, and I just knew that I made a wrong des design decision in, in, a, in a few fundamental places. So I just had to scrap it and start again. And that, for me, keeping the technology that flexible is critical in order to get it you know, into use. Um, I guess for me, the, the thing about what it is that I'm actually wanting to achieve isn't this bit of kit, it's teaching in a different way. It's having those discussions in the field about the interpretation of your data. And if I can achieve that in any way, I don't care what this is. I care what this is, but I, 
you know, that's, that's kind of what I want to be diffused, if you like. So the unlearning bit is me not being too precious, maybe, yeah. Uh, Richard, you are, is that all right? And welcome back. I was kind of uh, wanted to ask you um, a specific version of that question, which is when you got to the IT policy people yeah. in um, the field of politics, yeah. did, did you come across any tensions between what you were doing, what these groups were doing, as it were, at operational level, and the bigger picture? Because there's a huge sort of body of work on computer and technology. Like Dorothy and Barton, talked about the mutual shaping of technologies and organisations. Certainly, social shaping goes one way, but then yeah. you get operational technologies or strategic technologies yeah. that open up, open up possibilities that actually conflict with some wider picture. So, you know, yeah. fusion technologies can be about sort of overcoming those blockages or shocks, or yeah. the breakdowns. It's just your, your, your picture is wonderful and a fantastic job of understanding the social context. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, you know, is, what's, what's, where are the tensions and how, how does this wonderful thing, how's it going to be shaped next? Yeah. Um, I suppose it's just, I mean, I think you've run together a number of different sort of versions of what social shaping Yes. Yes. Social construction yes. of knowledge, the social shaping technology, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. But social shaping is also about conflicts between different logics and different yeah. social spheres and temporary truces and shocks and then one knocking the other. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering where your where your line, you know, what or how much, what's the what's the, what's the next? Triability. What's the next trial of this? Who's going to try it? Yeah. And how's it going? Because triability is about adaptation. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Where's it going to go next? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'll try to answer a bit, and then I'll come back and check it out or kind of address it. So some of the IT we said in terms of policy and practice and, and stuff. The institution across the board tends to use laptops because they're very mobile, uh, and each of the tutors has got a laptop. It's all Windows based and they go into whatever classroom, they connect it to the data projector or their interactive whiteboard, and they, they do their stuff, that, you know, PowerPoint-based, kind of office-based stuff. Um, <clears throat> this has all been developed on Linux-based operating system. Uh, the websites that the Field Studies Council do is done with a, uh, a content management system called um Umbraco, I think, Umbraco. I can't say the word right, but it's a Microsoft-based thing. Uh, and this one is developed in Drupal, which is quite fundamentally different. So there's a lot of differences in terms of technical detail, right? Um, but not one of those decisions was made independently by me. It was with some of the IT people. So, and it played out in some strange ways, you know. So, so part of it was that the IT team saw this as an opportunity to learn something new. It was a bit novel, a bit of a project, a bit of something different, let's try it, kind of thing. Uh, the, the Linux versus Windows thing, I explained, and, and this came out of another project, was that and when we worked in schools, uh, taking laptops and stuff into schools, uh, they would get every virus under the sun. Uh, schools tend to be Windows-based machines. If you take a Linux laptop in there, it doesn't get the virus because the operating system is different. Uh, so it's, a, it's different enough that people don't mess with it. And I explained this to the IT people, and you could see their eyes. <laughs> they suddenly realized that it wouldn't have to do the updates. They could set it up once. And the way that they set up these machines is that they create one, and then they make a copy of it in what's called an image. Right? So it's something on a USB pen right? that you can put into another computer, press a button, and it makes that computer the same as this one. It installs its image onto that, which is the website and everything all set up. So for an IT team, bloody winner, that is. That's dead easy. And you know that people aren't going to mess with it. So there were these tensions that we kind of negotiated through. Things like the website stuff, they, they realized that there were limitations and issues with the system they were using. This other system that we used had a few other benefits. So there's a resolution of the two. Ultimately, I could, couldn't care less if it goes in a Windows machine and if it uses the Umbraco system instead of Drupal. To me, that's not the point. The point is that it's something sustainable and usable for them in the longer term. So, I haven't resolved all the IT tensions, but, but we're kind of getting there. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, a lot of it was me taking the technology down, working with the IT folks, and then them doing it for themselves, breaking it, fixing it, working it out, and then coming back with the, with the kind of agreed way to do stuff, which isn't, you know, it, it's partly this context, you know, is that those guys were up for it. It was collaboration that, that enabled them to do a few things. So may not be big picture. Any more? Please. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, yeah. One is uh, sort of in this theoretical end of things. Yeah. So you describe the theory and you describe yeah. sort of how your experience allows you to apply that all implicitly. Right. But I wonder whether there's a sort of missed opportunity of trying to apply it more explicitly, you know, by, by sort of drawing out that under this theory that's a, a boundary issue and there's, diff there's a conf conf uh, contradiction between views and things like that. Uh, so that you can be more sure about the answers you can give, because I think otherwise, in a sense, it's the, it's a bit you're really good at this, mm -hmm. and it's how can you sort of get somebody else to be really good at this? By what, what process? So, are the theories that you've outlined sort of something that you can actually turn into guidance, into ways in which you can help people understand complex situations and solve them? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're kind of right. There, there is this, um, and I'll totally put my hand up and say that I'm not the best at doing that uh, audit trail between a theory and, and practice stuff, right? Um, but I can't separate the two, and that's partly uh, one of my failings. So for me, the, the way that you go in and talk to people and the reason why you go in and talk to them and how you talk to them is all determined by that reading, by the theory stuff, yeah? Um, and the idea about the design-based research approach would be that you would explicitly plan some intervention where, where you're going to change uh, something and observe the effect of it to try to, to try to make those kind of arguments. In this context, I didn't have a lot of time to do those iterations. They were very much uh, quite, done quite quickly to, to get just within the context of what we could do and try to get something set up. I'd like to go back and be a bit more structured around um, auditing the process that happens next. So, you know, it going into this organization and them doing it for themselves, I'm there still to try to facilitate and help that process, but um, if I can get a grant to give them the research time to, to get there and observe in a bit more structured way, I think that would be an awesome thing to do. Um, in terms of like how, how you do it, there's, I, I do really, I kind of really do believe that this sort of theory stuff is the foundation for the process, for the practice. There's no other way around it. So um, in trying to understand the activities, uh, I'd go along, I'd, I'd get all the teaching resources, and I barely understood them, obviously. Why would I? Um, I went and observed the classes, and I could understand what they were doing, but I didn't understand why. And then, for me, the most effective method, which I based on, um, there's an approach called cognitive walkthrough, which Clayton Lewis and some folks at Colorado and a few other places have, have used. But it's this idea of walking through a process in a very structured, you know, use your real materials, actually go through it step by step. And I would get the, the tutors to do that with me or the IT team to do that with me. And I'd pause them and say, you know, why are you doing that? How is it that that, that is? So this process of getting them to stop and explain. So it would take three times as long to do any damn thing. And then we'd sit down together and write it up as a set of notes that they would agree on. So this is a method. For me, it's the activity stuff. It's the how, the what, and the why embedded in practice, you know? The fact that we haven't got a class of, of kids with us at the time lets me do that, breaking it up in terms of an activity. But um, th it wouldn't occur to me to do it that way if it wasn't for all this other stuff. The activity-based stuff, I think, is a fundamental bit. Yeah, exactly the sort of thing I was looking for. Uh, How do you turn that into, into a method? The other, I've got another, the other question is sort of more practical. It's just I'm aware of what... Uh, I think you were involved in the PI project, weren't yes, you? Yes, I was. Yeah. And there you were giving sort of a design tool for people to design the inquiry process. Yeah. As far as I could tell in what you were saying, here's a web server, they put stuff on the web server and they pick it. So you haven't really sort of, in this case, had to go down giving them an activity design tool. It is, why have you come up with sort of different solutions in the two cases? Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, so p part of it is that I didn't have the time and resource to redo the inquiry stuff, the, the, the design tool. Um, but part of it was as well that I, for me to make a bespoke tool for them wouldn't be sustainable. So I just didn't have a choice. Uh, 
having it as a site, there, there, there are real practical tensions around what people would like to do and what the technology is kind of set up to do around this stuff. You know? So the, the web content management system is great for putting up web pages. If you've got a set of data records that you need to group in different ways, that's slightly pushing some of the boundaries a little bit. So it's trying to manage the design in a way that it keeps it within that, that kind of technical functionality. So it was, it was a little bit pig-headedness, just trying to keep it simple. Um, the, the, the inquiry stuff, the personal inquiry stuff, I think would have been challenging technically. Uh, not just for me, <laughs> not for them, but, but also for me, trying to get that, uh, getting a, an activity designed to is quite challenging. It's quite, quite a hard thing. Anne. Sorry, so moving on from that, um, so I suppose I was making connections with, this might have been a question that this was coming up with, with regards to, so it seems like it's a boundary object, at, but you're also connecting up with boundary as we would call it, boundary creatures who are yeah. teachers and the activity um, specialists at the field centre and the students. I suppose, taking it back to your theories, that you're talking about meaning making, yeah. that actually each of those different, which then I suppose comes back to the boundaries again and the tensions, their concept of meaning making will be different for each of them. So if going back, you identify if the, so you've, you've got this resource, rather than making the whole activity, you've faced, based it around that activity that's already predefined. Yeah. It's actually identifying, is this supporting, if it's changing the activity slightly, the device, the system process, mm. is that changing the meaning making, and does it fit? Because I wonder if the teachers and the field centre people really get social constructivism, and whether it actually fits with their, what they value. And is this giving them what they value for the learning process? Mm. The teachers and the field study centres, because I suspect it's all just, in the past, it's just been trying to keep it going. Oh, yeah, it's going to go out in the field, but is it supporting the learning? It seems to me there needs to be an evaluation of the learning and how this is supporting that learning progression and whether those different <coughs> stakeholders understand that and mm. see what it's doing, yeah. what it's not doing. Do you think that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all on for the, the evaluation of it would be cool. And I think um, for me, the focus needs to be around that process stuff, as you, as you, as you quite rightly say, you know. What is it that the, the tool in itself is, a, is just a mediation of activity, you know. What else, you know. So we're not evaluating the tool or the product as such. It's this change in process. So for me, the, and I can't say that in six months you change people's practices, because that's like crazy talk, you know. But you make them think in a little bit different way. So when uh, tutors were taking this out, one of the nice things that they did was that, um, and it was that without prompting from me, I just was lucky enough that I happened to be there to see it, was that uh, rather than bringing the folks, they, they do all the stuff in the classroom initially to set it all up, uh, made sure they're all familiar with the technology, they weren't going to be freaked or anything. We took them out to the pond, they did all the data collection stuff using the, these things, you know, all that stuff. Da -da -da. Um, and then before coming back in, the tutor stopped them all, got them all in a group, and they did the discussion of the analysis, the interpretation. So they had another 40 minutes stood in the field relating the findings to, to the environment around them. And that wasn't set up from, by me. It was that that tool changed how they mediated, you know, changed, the mediation of the tool changed the nature of their activity. And the, the learning as a result was changed. I'm not saying that that conversation wouldn't have happened. It would have happened back in the classroom. But the nature of the conversation would have been very different. And the process for the students would have been very, very different as well. So I think, I think, you know, there's a little bit around the tool. It's a little bit about understanding the values, as you say, making sure that they really get it as an active learning thing. For, for Field Studies Council, um, they're, they're pretty uh, forward thinking in terms of they really are kind of very much grounded in outdoor experiential learning. So it isn't, you know, for them, being out and about and interpreting what you see is the game. That, that's totally their value set. So. Yeah, just playing to that, that they ran with it. And I think, I think it, to evaluate it would be awesome. That would be a lovely thing to do next. Thanks, good to see you, Richard. Yeah. We're nearly done, folks. I'm sure we are. We should be finishing. Yep. <clears throat> Nick, go on. Thanks, Fred. Um, hey. I'm a fascinated. I came from the background where I did lots of participatory yeah. design and then went into social sciences. So yeah. it's really good to go um, through that story you told about here. Um, about the social constructivism and how you use that in design, real world design process. That was great. Thank you yeah. for that. My, um, I think I'm sort of riffing off some of these other questions about 
where are the where some of the knots and tensions might be in some of this stuff. Yeah. And I can see like a few that I just spit out randomly and see if you make anything of anything. Like I was I was entirely in agreement with you until you came to the Rogers stuff. Right. And my That's social helpful. science sort of antenna warning went up because yeah. I don't think the I'm not sure if the so idea of a social system is 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 as useful as it might be as as another way of thinking about the social um, might be because I don't tell you, I don't know if the social system is a flat thing. Yeah. Um, but obviously we all agree that it's you know people yeah, different right. within it and stuff like that. Sure. But also there are very fundamental and important and fertile differences between what people understand how people understand problems, yeah. how people understand you know the future. Yeah. You know, and, and this goes with pedagogy or climate change or all these sorts of things. So it was about how this how these sorts of things play out. And so, for example, you're using this fantastic process, but the pedagogy that the Film Studies Council are doing is really seems to me quite conservative still. You know, in terms of it's diffusing pre-existing knowledge about how science works and how you do how you do research, and you know, certain knowledge is there that they want to teach people. Yeah. It's not collectively generating knowledge in a more of a radical, sort of maybe an OU way. Um, it's not co-produced, what the knowledge is. You know, I went to, a, for a short time, a, a school where it was all project-based learning, okay. and we do a bit of art within the science and a bit of, you know, education within the maths or whatever mm -hmm. it was. You, they'd, mi they'd be mixing up disciplines. They weren't doing that. You're doing that. I'm not sure if they are. So, so there's issues. The issue there was about how this stuff is used in the wider social context. Is it used to support what kinds of debates and problems is it used for and how who gets to define the problems that it's used for is as much a is as much a issue for participation mm -hmm. as you know participatory designing around a very predefined problem. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. when you get the so the social is something that's much more lively around what the problem should be, yeah. what the future should be. It's not lots of these issues aren't already Consensual, just I mean, sure. narrow the problems. I'm not saying you do this, but I'm saying often these things are used to support very conservative product development processes. Still, yeah. you know, the the big the big corporates use anthropologists and action learning now to, to you know design new brands and new um, bits of kit on iPhones and things like that. It's not all that all this stuff doesn't have to be used to for an emancipatory project. It can be used for a very you know yeah, narrow yeah, and round. So it's kind of there's a politics around. It's something like that's which led me into social science really around yeah. how these things are used, who gets to use them, and when, how people are involved, yeah. and I think that's that's really important to also keep in mind. And we're not a sort of flat social system. That's why. No, no, no. Yeah, that. sorry. And I, I mean, the other thing is that you know I've obviously pulled together a huge range of really fundamentally different approaches, you know, um, just in trying to make sense of stuff. So I'm not saying that they're all compatible or that they all sit in the same way. Um, in terms of the conservative teaching approach, I think um, I would also kind of make a little bit of a caveat in that I've quite possibly oversimplified their teaching approach in trying to explain stuff. A lot of it is very much uh, active around, you know, the groups genuinely coming up with their own hypothesis, what they feel they're going to find out, stuff like that. A lot of the centers are, are, are gathering data and contributing to these national data sets partly as that very much, um, you know, authentic science, valued science stuff. Uh, where, the, where the groups are having a bit of an input in terms of how that's interpreted and what it really means and stuff. So there's, there's some of that stuff. I wouldn't like to say it's totally conservative. In terms of the politics of the choices, there were a lot of tensions around within the organization of who um, was part of the project. You know, when I, when I contacted the head office and tried to get them involved, I'd contacted some of the centers as well. And the head office kind of felt that one of the centers should take the lead initially. Uh, and work with a very specific team in a specific context, with the idea then that it could be put out to other groups. And during the course of that first, you know, set of it, there were certainly tensions where I would meet other centres who were quite keen to be involved, or maybe not ready to be involved at that time, and things like that. So there's there's a lot of politics within the organisation, and, and trying to make it um, democratic and fair in terms of what it gets used for. I think it's really key. There, there's so I just say there is a, a bit of a push now for the because our wonderful education system, the curriculum is changing rapidly all the time. So there's quite now a, a few opportunities to be part of new curriculum development. So new courses and stuff that have been put together. So rather than taking the technology and used in a way that has been used or you know, maybe modifying a use that's been around for a long time, thinking about maybe teaching differently for a new curriculum, which is, might be an opportunity for some of that stuff. 
This is the last one. Shall we? Is that? So what age you mm. Okay. So for uh, I think for all of the activities, for those three activities that I described, they do do it from the primary, uh, early primary, through to the the A level, right? But obviously, the nature of what you do is very different. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the kind of kit that you use and the explanation that you give is totally different. Um, so. The, in the development of the website and the way we've oriented it has been for the A-level and O-level groups. Uh, so some of the language and stuff is more tied to that. Um, but with the idea that with some modifications you can then you know, duplicate that and make a version for the earlier years and stuff like that. It's things around the equipment that they use, how they introduce it. Uh, the kind of concepts that they introduce are quite different, obviously, for, for the different groups. Um, and the amount of data that they take. Because really, small ones, you don't want to be out there too long. Practical stuff. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, very much. I hope that's okay. Cheers, guys.